Today we're going to talk about some of the tags that you may find extremely useful as you go and try to add blocks of code and simple snippets of different things to your web page. I know that it can seem overwhelming how many tags there are in HTML5. So today, I'm going to try to break down some of the most useful ones. Now, I realize it may see, seem overwhelming as I start throwing all these elements at you. You're not supposed to memorize them all by the end of this lecture. Instead, I'm really just trying to give you a taste for what's out there so you can start playing with your own code. So one of the first things you need to decide when you're coding is which tags are you going to use? There are the generic kind of what we call block tags, paragraph and div, that break your code into nice sections. Paragraph is kind of self-explanatory, and div gives you a way to put groups of content together. But the problem with both div and paragraph is that they're very generic. So we want to move over to the idea of using these semantic tags, such as header and nav, footer and figure. And we talked about those in an earlier video. Some of the other block tags that you may not be familiar with are listed here. The first one are the containers. Containers are simple things where you can put like-minded code together. So you might have an article or an aside, a section, main. Again, they almost seem generic in their names, but as you grow more comfortable, as you're designing your website, you can start to see like, oh, this isn't a generic section. This really is an aside. The next block tag is HR, or horizontal rule. And it's really an interesting idea because it doesn't contain any text at all. Just to remind you, block tags are tags that have the display block. It means it forces a new line above and below. There's never going to be anything next to it by default. So our hard rule will just put a single line across your page. Simple, yet very, very much used by many people. The next one is address. This will go ahead and be a block tag, and it doesn't format your, your uh, address any differently than other text, but what it does is it allows screen readers and other assistive devices to quickly and easily find if they're looking for your address. Block quote would be another block tag, as well as details. Now, the details tag is very interesting, and it's kind of cool if you can get it to work. And what it does is it allows you to kind of have this drop-down, open and close idea with your text. Now, just to warn you, it is not implemented in Firefox, so if you, someone with Firefox tries to run it, it's just going to kind of default to this open idea. All right, so there's HR, address, block, quote, and details. I've told you what they were. My guess is you still have no idea what they really do, so let's take a look at a quick example. So here would be an example of the HR element. It's just a simple line across the screen. Nothing too fancy, but very recognizable. The next one, the address element. In this case, the browser does italicize what's inside the contents. I had to put my own end line here, but otherwise, it just looks kind of italicized. But you can't be sure that it'll be italicized on every browser. It's really specific to Chrome, Firefox, Safari, et cetera. But the important thing to know is that there's semantic meaning here. Here, we have a block quote. And what block quote does is it let, indents the code and kind of lets people know that there's a quote that you're looking at. One of the things I put inside my block quote was I put in a site tag so that someone can know right away that I've cited Napoleon Hill. So if someone's doing a search for Napoleon Hill, this is going to up the chances that a search engine will link back to your page. The last one, details, is kind of combined with a summary tag. So I'm going to go ahead and click here, and you can see that it opens and closes. So the default is to have it closed and then open up when someone clicks on the little arrow icon right here. Now, one of the things I mentioned is that it's not supported on Firefox. So if you're looking at this page on Firefox, by default, you're just going to see it in the open context. So let's go ahead and go back to some other tags that aren't block tags. We're going to do some inline tags. Again, remember, inline tags just means that you can put it into the page and go all in a line, one after the other. You don't need to uh, break things up. So span was the original inline tag for plain text. You would put span around some code, and then you could go ahead and style it any way you wanted to. Now, in addition, we have site, abbreviation, time, code, and then the subscript and the superscript. Now, if you're watching closely, you may have noticed that I left a little typo after abbreviation there. So make sure you go ahead and put in the less than or greater sign. But let's look at examples of this code as well. Here I have my inline elements. The site basically makes it easier for people or bots to search your code. So I went ahead and put this code right inside a site tag. Now again, this particular browser happened to style it differently, but that's not always going to be the case. 
Another new tag that has come along recently is the abbreviation tag. So if you notice, right along here, I've included abbreviation inside the box. Now, if you can, watch what happens when I put my mouse over the Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. As I hover over it, it's very small probably on your screen, but you can see that the expanded version of the abbreviation pops up. So I have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Now, from an accessibility screen point, it can actually go ahead and read the expanded version. But even for people who aren't using screen readers, I actually find that you need to do something to let people know that hovering over is even an option. Most people wouldn't think about that. The time attribute is another one that is just in line, and most of us won't even know it's there. But it allows you to give extra semantic meaning. So the party starts at 9 PM, makes perfect sense to us. But the party took place on New Year's Eve. Notice again, that's actually a time, even though it's not our typical numeric time. It is a time. By putting in different time tags, it's also much more likely that if someone's using, accessing your site on a mobile phone, it'll pop up as knowing that it's a date. Sometimes you would like to be able to identify parts of your code as code fragments. This happens to me all the time because you know I'm a computer scientist. So the code elements tend to be displayed in different font, but it's not always the case. But code is just a nice way to break it up and let people know what is this crazy stuff people are typing? Oh, it's code. It's not supposed to make sense. Finally, the last two are subscript and superscript. And these are used to create, a lot of times, mathematical formulas. So you can see here, I've raised up the three, and I've lowered down the two. So I've given you kind of the, the general block tags, the general inline tags that people use. Um, and there's other tags that people use quite often that you may see when you're looking at their pages. The, the issue with these tags is that they, when I say, need more. It's really weird to use these tags unless you're also incorporating them with JavaScript or some other elements that you probably don't know a lot with yet. So these include the button, the meter, progress, iframe, BDO, which stands for bidirectional orientation, and then the map attribute along with area. Now, people really like these, but they tend to need JavaScript. So I'm going to show you a quick example, but I'm not going to include the fancy add-ons you would need to use them, because I don't. that's not what this course is about. Right now, we're just learning these tags. So let's take a look at them so you can see what they look like visually and understand that they're not actually functioning yet. So my special tags that need more, I've called it. Um, I'm a little worried that you might not even be able to see it because it's so light and screen. But you can see I've included some open and close buttons. They don't do anything, but they look really nice. So go ahead and put them in if you want. But it may confuse people that they're not actually operationable. The next one is meter, and you've probably seen this before. Um, basically, how this one works, let me actually bring up the code for this, for this one. Window. You can see for the meter one, I've actually gone in here and put in meter, minimum value of 0, maximum value of 100, and my current value is 50. So you can see it's colored in until about pretty much halfway through. All right. Same here with the next one. I've set it to 25%. Here, I just wanted to show you that it doesn't always have to be 0 to 100. You can start at 5 and go to 10, and I've set it to 8, which is 60%. So that's kind of how the meter works. Progress is very similar to meter in that it shows kind of a, a proportional value. Now, with progress, you're expecting that you're doing something where eventually you'll get to 100. So you've taken surveys before where as you filled in, the progress bar fills in. Again, both meter and progress tend to use JavaScript to update them. The next one I was going to show you is iframe. iframe is used to net content within each other. It is not equal well supported by all the browsers, so you'd really want to explore um, who can use it and the best way to use it. And you would definitely want to look into options such as height and width. So right here in my iframe, I've said, hey, let's go ahead and link back to my page. And it puts my whole web page inside this little block of the page. Down here, I went ahead and said, hey, let's do that iframe again. But this time, let's go ahead and have it take up a much bigger width. All right? Now, one thing you can notice is I can still click in here. I can do all the things. It's as if I have a web page inside of a web page. The last one, oops, let's go down here. I want to show you is the bidirectional orientation. Um, and this one is would be something you would use if your particular language tends to not just go from left to right and instead goes right to left. So bidirectional orientation takes either RTL, which stands for right to left, or 
LTR, which stands for left to right, and you can go ahead and put in the text. So here is my going from left to right, and here's the same thing going right to left. Um, I didn't really give examples of the map with the area because, again, this is one where you would really need to understand JavaScript to really embrace what it's doing. So I realize I went over a lot of tags that you just right now, and some of the code you probably understood, and some of it you didn't. But all the code is online, so you can go ahead, you can download it, you can play with it, you can change it. All right? But as you code, you're not supposed to go in and be like, oh, I'm going to try to use every possible tag I can to show how much I know about HTML. No. Use the most specific tag possible. Whenever you're not sure, go ahead and ask somebody else. Say, what would happen if I were trying to look at this page with my eyes closed? Would I understand what's going on? The second thing you need to understand is that sometimes your tags just don't work. Now, there are two reasons that your tags may or may not work. The first one might just be you have a syntax error. So make sure you run your code through a validator, and that will help you find places where you haven't closed tags. This is especially important if you nest tags, meaning you put one inside the other. The other thing you really want to do is you want to run your code in multiple browsers. So even if your page looks great when you're running it in Chrome, make sure you check it out on Firefox. If it looks great on Safari, make sure you check it on Chrome. It's really important that you make sure that your pages can be reachable to the greatest number of people possible. And really, the only way you can do this is by keeping your code simple, succinct, and you're always validating. Thanks. One of the things that I'm constantly talking about in my courses is accessibility. The thing is I've come to realize is that I can talk about this as much as I want, but it's really up to me to show to you why it's so important for you to make the web as accessible as possible for others. So today, we're going to talk about three things. First, I'd like to explain what a web accessibility professional does. Second, we're going to talk in depth about how disabilities relate to the web. Finally, I'm going to introduce for the first time the four principles of accessible interface design. These four principles are something that will hopefully guide you throughout the entire time you're making web pages. So let's start off with this whole idea of what a web accessibility coordinator does. One of my pet peeves is people who say they don't want to go into technology because they'd rather do something where they can help people. Well, my follow through to that is that if you really want to help people, you need to understand technology. So one of the things that people like to do is find careers where they can help people who have issues and work together with people who are in technology. And that's exactly the type of thing a web accessibility coordinator will do. So first, one thing they might do is help guide policy and purchasing decisions on what kind of software is most accessible to the widest range of people. Second, they can evaluate web interfaces for accessibility. So by learning just some key tips and tricks, they can go to different pages and find out where there might be pitfalls for people. Third, they can assist people with disabilities to access online infrastructure. Most universities and large companies will always have someone whose job it is to assist those who need some help accessing online material, or really any type of technological tools. Fourth, it's very important that people keep pace with changing technology. You will always have a job if you can find a way to combine your love with helping people with the different tools that are being used. So let's talk specifics. According to the 2012 US Census, one in five people in the U.S. have a disability. That means that there are 60 million people in the U.S. who are dealing with issues that other people may not have, and half of them are impeded from using the Internet. So we will talk briefly about four issues that tend to pop up the most when dealing with disabilities in the Internet. Visual issues, hearing, motor, and cognitive. When you talk about accessibility, almost everyone thinks about screen readers. They design and say, oh, I'm going to make sure that my page will read well on a screen reader. However, it's much, much more than that. While 1.8 million people are completely blind, we also have 8 million people who have difficulty reading ordinary newsprint, even with their glasses on. So one of the things that we want to think about when we're designing is more than just font size. We also need to think about color contrast, your different font style. Can someone really see your page as easily as possible? We're also going to want to think about hearing disabilities, and we're talking both from partial to total deafness. 
So eight million people have difficulty hearing a normal conversation, and one million are completely deaf. More and more places are moving to online presence, and of course, we all know that watching videos online is a very common thing. We're all doing it right now. So one of the things to think about if you decide to add videos to your site is, did you include closed captioning to really make sure as many people as possible can access your content? But there's also other things to think about. Are you blaring music? You might have users who don't even realize that music is playing. Or perhaps you have things so low that people can't quite grasp what you're saying. One of the things we're going to talk about is making sure that people have the ability to control the different multimedia that you're going to put in your page. This is going to help people with hearing disabilities feel that they are in command of the technology, not that the technology is in command of them. One of my own personal issues is that of motor disabilities. There are many, many people who are unable to use a mouse or a physical keyboard. Maybe they have slow response time or just limited fine motor skills. So dexterity issues are something that affects 8 million people who have difficulty using their arms or hands. But my guess is that for most of us have had some issue with trying to use the web and not being quite able to do what we hope to do. So one issue that we talk about is what happens when someone tries to tab through your page. This is a very common way for people to get through pages, but unless you're very careful, you can make it that people tab through to nowhere. Another issue is, do you require a steady hand? Many people like to add flashy and cool graphics and animations to their page, but I know that I personally have been frustrated at trying to click a button while the button keeps moving around the screen. Another issue is cognitive disabilities. And when we talk about cognitive disabilities, there's a very wide range of issues we might be talking about. There's learning disabilities, distractibility, dyslexia, even the ability to remember or focus on large amounts of information. So one of the things I was laughing at when I looked at this slide just now is that this slide perhaps has too much text on it for people to really be able to focus on what I'm looking at. So we're talking that there are 16 million adults with ADD or ADHD. Another overlooked population is that there are a large number of soldiers, Marines, and National Guard members who have different psychological conditions such as traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress disorder. Now what does that have to do with making your web accessible? We want to make sure that things are easy to understand, not flashing, not requiring great amounts of com concentration. Cognitive disabilities number greater than physical and perceptual disabilities combined. So it's something that you want to think about when you're designing your page or even if you're just helping other people design theirs. So let's get to specific stats because nothing helps me convince people more that they want to design for the web than showing them the numbers. So almost 10% of the U.S. population has two or more disabilities. 40,000 people in the U.S. are both deaf and blind. So think about trying to access technology when you have those types of issues. 41% of adults 65 and older have a disability. And there are almost 9 million people with disabilities who are poor. 70% of the disabled are underemployed or unemployed. The issue is not that they are not able to do the jobs that are out there. Many times there are roadblocks put up there that they can't get through in order to do jobs that they are very well qualified for. So the web offers unprecedented opportunities for the disabled. Here we are right now all taking a class online. So education has the benefit in that we teachers can reach as many people as we can. And for students, it means that you have access to resources that you never had before. Many, many people get their news from online resources. So we want to make sure that we make it as available to everybody. Commerce I find particularly interesting because many, many places have online presences. But are they even realizing that they're alienating such a large customer base? And of course, the social benefits of the web are easy to see. So many people have created more friends online than they actually have in real life. So the benefits of the web are amplified for the disabled. People who before could not access education, news, commerce, or social interaction are now able to do that. So the web is an enabling technology, and we want to make sure that we continue to make it so. So hopefully I've convinced you just from a human standpoint that it's important to make your web pages accessible. But there are, of course, legal aspects as well. The Department of Justice is in the process of updating the Americans with Disabilities Act to include online resources of state and local entities. What this means is that universities, state governments, local governments all need to make sure that the things that 
that the information they have online is accessible to everyone. There are many instances of case law where individuals or groups have filed civil complaints against universities, companies, because that they feel that their products are not accessible to people in a way that it should be. So let's just review this for a second. What is web accessibility? What it is is making sure that you're making your web accessible for the widest possible audience. This includes people with permanent disabilities and those with temporary disabilities. Currently, the online infrastructure, while a wonderful resource, is hostile to those with disabilities. Another issue you want to think about is that accessibility is inseparable from search engine optimization, mobile technology, and usability. Improve one of these things and you can improve all the others. So what's the best way to accomplish accessibility? It's adherence to standards. As you start now, you're at the very beginning of your web career, it's the perfect time for you to learn the best possible tags and the best possible ways to make your page accessible. These standards are going to come from the W3C Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, it's called WCAG. And these guidelines are principle, not technology-based. What this means is that you don't need to go out and find the greatest language or the greatest technology to make your page accessible. Instead, you really just need to follow four principles as you design your sites. Is my site perceivable? Is it operable? Is it understandable? And is it robust? We'll be talking about these four principles throughout our entire course. So let's review quickly. I know that right now you're just starting your, your web design career, and it can be overwhelming. But I'm really hoping that one of the things you'll make sure that you do is design with accessibility in mind. It is the right thing to do for so many reasons. Whether it's because you really want to reach out to the largest customer base you can, or because legally it's required, the important thing is make sure you do it. And the great thing is, accessible design is actually pretty straightforward. All you need to do is adhere to standards. The reason that many pages are inaccessible is because they're trying to be flashy and cool and do things that aren't quite yet fully implemented to standards. So finally, as we go through this class, make sure you pay special attention to the semantics behind HTML tags. These semantics contain special information that are going to make it much easier for people who are using assistive devices to understand the content of your page. Together, we can make sure that the next generation of web developers are designing for the greatest possible audience.